Arrancamos de... Mr. Speaker, I have the honor this afternoon to present to the National Assembly the budget proposals for the financial year 2020-2021. Mr. Speaker, since as this is my maiden speech to this House as the Minister of Finance and Economic Development and as a member of Parliament for Lobatsi, allow me first to pay tribute to my late parents. Mr. Collins Ulifile Matseka and Mrs. Patricia Jolani Belina Matseka. May their soul rest in eternal peace. Mr. Collins Matseka worked for the government of Botswana as a civil servant in the Ministry of Agriculture. Whilst Mrs. Patricia Jolani Belina Matseka was a teacher who had to resign from her teaching post in Muchudi to look after my sisters and I, for which we will forever be grateful. Mr. Speaker, great men have stood here to deliver budget speeches in the same capacity as myself. I would like to acknowledge their contribution to the prudent stewardship of the finances of this country. To them I say thank you for your contribution and the foundation you have laid for all of us to follow. To my immediate predecessor, Mr. Kenneth Omatambo, on behalf of government and the ministry, I wish to say thank you for your dedicated service to this country, including many years as a civil servant and public officer. Mr. Speaker, I wish to further thank the voters who, has, who have demonstrated continued confidence in the Botswana Democratic Party. To lead, to, to, to lead this country, to lead this country and transform it from the current upper middle income to high income status, as indicated in the BDP manifesto. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I wish to congratulate His Excellency the President, Dr. Mukwesi Eriki Abetsumasisi, for his victory and leadership, and forming a government to lead Botswana in the next five years. Congratulations, sir. Your legitimacy, sir, has also been confirmed by the highest court in the land as recent as last week. Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to transforming the economy through refocusing existing policies, strategies and programs, such as service delivery through ICT, creating sustainable jobs, fighting corruption, improving education and training, providing quality health care, and attracting local and international investors in order to create an inclusive economy with greater citizen participation. The focus, Mr. Speaker, is to improve efficiency in government spending and deliver of services to promote the growth of the private sector in order to transform our economy to a high income status. Mr. Speaker, each year, Botswana look forward to hear from all those who have stood at this podium, not only how government is spending their taxes, but also whether they stand to benefit from the initiatives proposed in these budget speeches. I am therefore consciously subjecting myself to that test, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the proposed initiatives in this year's budgets are guided by the country's vision 2036, which is the primary and guiding document for the future of our nation. This vision is for a Botswana that achieves a high income status by the year 2036. Mr. Speaker, the vision sets high and ambitious targets for all stakeholders to move the country forward. It calls for a renewed 
for a review of operational plans and strategies for national economic and social development. Hence, the vision is about a transformed Botswana. Transforming Botswana from one status to the other is not new, Mr. Speaker. This BDP government is responsible for transforming the economy from the birth of our democracy and country in 1966, when Botswana was classified as a low-income country, and transformed it to a middle-income economy by the early 1980s. The same government transformed this economy to an upper middle income status in the 1990s. This has happened despite the enormous challenges presented by the world economic collapse of 1998 and the global financial and economic crisis of 2008-2009. At present, our major objective is to transform this economy to a high income status by the year 2036. I must add, Mr. Speaker, that no other party in this country has the experience to transform the economy. Hence, the voters' wisdom to entrust this important task to this government. And this government will not disappoint, but do it again. Mr. Speaker, the transformation journey to high income status will commence with this 2020 2021 budget and continue to be perfected in the ongoing preparation of the midterm review of NDP 11. Some of the preliminary indications from the review are that economic performance was in line with the original NDP 11 projections. While economic diversification progressed fairly well during the first half of NDP 11. Mr. Speaker, successful economic diversification requires an economic growth rate that is high enough to generate sufficient jobs to address unemployment, raise household incomes, and reduce poverty. This has not yet been achieved, and the unemployment rate has remained a cause for concern at an annual rate of 17.6% of the labor force in 2015-2016. Therefore, accelerated growth consistent with Vision 2036 will require a mix of policies that promote export diversification in goods and services to impact unemployment, especially amongst the youth. Mr. Speaker, Statistics Botswana recently released its first ever quarterly labor force survey results for the three months of July to September 2019 which show an unemployment rate of 20.7% for that quarter. These results are for one quarter only and are therefore subject to seasonal variation. It is therefore important to know that the unemployment rate of 20.7% for the quarter cannot directly be compared with the 17.6% annual rate as calculated in 2015-2016. Mr. Speaker, According to the midterm review of NDP 11, the country's fiscal position has experienced large deficits. As government continued to invest in economic and social infrastructure, as in education and health facilities. However, the outcome of, this, of the sectors remain below expectations. Mr. Speaker, the transformation program requires a fresh look at the economic and social returns to this level of investment, and not only in the identified areas, but across the economy. Mr. Speaker, the midterm review of NDP 11 has identified critical issues that Botswana confronts as we move into the second half of NDP 11. These include the following. The need for economic transformation, macroeconomic stability, greater socioeconomic inclusion, improved quality of public services, the changing world of diamonds, and climate change. In order to align the national policy priorities with the emerging critical issues, 
four national policy priorities are proposed for the remainder of NDP level. The first priority, Mr. Speaker, is the promotion of export-led growth. The objective is to ensure that the drivers of economic growth in Botswana shift towards export promotion. This, Mr. Speaker, will address the balance of payments problem, which has emerged in recent years as a constraint to economic growth. As a result, greater effort is required in implementing the, the country's export strategy, since increased exports of goods and services do not only contribute to growth, improve balance of payment positions, but are, are necessary for replenishing the country's foreign exchange reserves. The second identified priority is ensuring more efficient government spending and financing. Mr. Speaker, for the past four years, the economy has experienced a less favorable fiscal position. This is a priority for my ministry as well as the whole of government. It requires that we ensure that spending is as efficient as possible in order to return to a sustainable fiscal pathway. The proposed measures to be implemented include the following. Improved appraisal design costing and implementation of public sector investment projects. Careful scrutiny of subsidy schemes and termination of those that do not address market failure or assist Julie Nidi Batwa and clamping down on corruption and waste. Mr. Speaker, it will also include reprioritization of, of approved projects and programs to align them with emerging transformational needs. It cannot, Mr. Speaker, be business as usual. The third priority is building human capital. The government remains committed to improving human capital skills and knowledge as they are critical inputs to private sector development and industrialization. In addition to availing financial resources towards the building of human capital, more measures will be taken to reform the entire education sector as part of the transformation agenda. The fourth pillar is the provision of appropriate infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the availability of appropriate infrastructure is critical for enhancing efficiency and providing the gateway for private sector participation. To achieve this, government will, starting with this financial year, prioritize provision of infrastructure that has the highest potential to increase productivity in key economic sectors in order to drive the transformation. The infrastructure provision will recognize the dire need for investment to promote a cluster development approach as approved in the Special Economic Zones policy. Mr. Speaker, the transformation journey will not spare any institution. It is a call on all stakeholders to leave the ideals of Vision 2036. And each and every institution will have to play its part in contributing positively towards attaining these four priority areas that I've just outlined. By design, these priority areas are premised on a private sector-driven economy that will deliver on jobs, equitable income distribution, and poverty elevation. Economic review and outlook. Mr. Speaker, the budget proposals for the financial year 2020-21 are presented against the backdrop of continued uncertainty in the global economy, with adverse implications on the domestic economy. As a small open economy, the continued tensions between the United States of America and China, who are the two major markets for our diamond exports, continues to undermine the country's economic performance in general and the fiscal position in particular. It also heightens the need for measures to promote diversified exports to reduce the impact of external shocks on the domestic economy. 
Mr. Speaker, global growth is expected to be moderate in 2020, with the world economic forecast expected to pick up to 3.3%, driven by expected growth in both emerging and developing, developing economies. Whereas growth in advanced economies is projected to remain subdued. Mr. Speaker, the domestic economy continues to record positive growth rates, despite the challenges arising from a weak and uncertain global economic environment. Mr. Speaker, as part of the transformation agenda, government will be refocusing attention to the agricultural sector and manufacturing sectors during the midterm review of NDP level. As, this, as these sectors have the potential to boost economic growth, promote export development, create job opportunities, and reduce poverty. In this connection, a review of programs and subsidies will be performed to align them with the transformation agenda and ensure that they contribute to greater private sector participation. Mr. Speaker, over the past years, the performance of the Pula exchange rate has been consistent with the country's exchange rate policy, objective of maintaining competitiveness of the country's industries in both domestic and international markets. This is achieved through the operation of a basket mechanism, wherein the main variables are currency weights and a rate of crawl. An annual review of these parameters is therefore in line with the policy of maintaining a competitive exchange rate environment to support the transformation agenda, rather than an act of devaluation or revaluation of the exchange rate. Mr. Speaker, the preliminary balance of payments for 2019 indicates a deficit of 10 billion, following a, low, a lower deficit of 4.2 billion in 2018. This deficit was due to a significant increase in imports compared to exports. Therefore, more needs to be done to promote the growth and diversification of the country's export base. And this will be intensified, focusing on agriculture and manufacturing value chains. To this end, Mr. Speaker, the transformation program requires a review of the, of the country's entire ecosystem for promoting exports, including regulatory environment, fiscal incentives, and provision of basic infrastructure. On the other hand, growth in imports has continued, continuously outpaced that of exports in recent years, resulting in trade deficits. To reverse this, this trend, measures will also be required to reduce on imports through the implementation of a very robust import substitution strategy. Mr. Speaker, this country imports most of its requirements, including basic products that do not require huge investment to produce locally. Using government's purchasing power through programs as, as the economic diversification drive and citizen empowerment initiatives, additional measures will be put in place to ensure reduction in the country's import bill. It is only through a deliberate and vigorous implementation of the export strategy and, and import substitution strategy that the country can restore its external balance and create the jobs that are required in an inclusive economy in which Botswana are major players. Mr. Speaker, the country's external balance, negative external balance, in recent years has undermined the growth of the country's foreign exchange reserves. As at the end of November 2019, foreign exchange reserves amounted to 70.6 billion, a decrease from 74.5 billion in November 2018. These foreign exchange reserves are equivalent to 14 months 
of import cover of goods and services. And of the total amount of foreign exchange reserves recorded in November 2019, government investment account stood at 16.3 billion. compared to 26.7 billion in November 2018. Performance of state-owned enterprises. Mr. Speaker, state-owned enterprises or parastatal organizations, as they are commonly referred to in our country, are part of a government's delivery system. As such, they are critical, they are critical to the transformation agenda. There are currently over 60 state-owned enterprises in this country. Six zero, ranging from regulatory through to academic and to commercial ones. To transform this country, the role of these state-owned enterprises will have to be revisited in order to align them to the transformational agenda. Mr. Speaker, when establishing these organizations, government has specific developmental goals to achieve, which it was felt could be achieved better and more, much more efficiently through the alternative delivery model of parastatals instead of the public service. However, the performance of some of these organizations indicate that either this original assumption was wrong or there has been some creep in their mandates over time. Whatever the case may be, there is need to revisit most of the mandates and founding statutes of these organizations to address the governance and performance of some of them, and more importantly, align them to the transformation agenda. To this end, Mr. Speaker, a subcommittee of cabinet, which I chair, will undertake a comprehensive review of the parastatals landscape. The terms of reference of this subcommittee are brought to cover the review of the mandates, governance, performance of these organizations, with a view to proposing specific recommendations to government on the relevance of some of these organizations and their financial sustainability. Mr. Speaker, government spends substantial resources on parastatal organizations in the form of subventions or grants. For instance, an amount of 4.9 billion is proposed as subvention to various state-owned enterprises for the financial year 2020-2021. It is therefore important that these resources be used efficiently to contribute to the transformation agenda. In this regard, government through the Cabinet Subcommittee will be interrogating the efficient use of public resources deployed to these organizations and provide value for money to the taxpayer. In addition, government will develop standards of benefits across the public sector, including state-owned enterprises, in order to curb wastage. Mr. Speaker, the reform of parastatals alone will not allow for growth and realization of the transformation agenda. The parent ministries and government in general will have to demonstrate reform of their internal processes to support transformation. The transformation requirement is for all institutions of this economy, including the private sector. Mr. Speaker, Government will take bold decisions on the reform of state-owned enterprises during the course of this financial year, following the recommendations of the Cabinet Subcommittee. <laughs> However, given the depressed state of, the, of, the para, of two of the parastatal organizations, namely the Botswana Meat Commission and the National Development Bank, government has had to take immediate decisions. The Botswana Meat Commission, which provides a market for cattle farmers, is technically insolvent. Despite government's recent capital injections of close to a billion pula. 
Mr. Speaker, in order to address these challenges, government has, under, has taken a decision to engage a management company to take over the running of the BMC with effect from, the, from April 2020. This measure is intended to protect the interests of all stakeholders, including farmers. And more details on the matter would be provided by my colleague, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Development and Food Security, in the presentation of his Committee of Supply speech later to this House. Another aspect, Mr. Speaker, of the transition is the ultimate privatization of, of BMC. The objective of the privatization of BMC is, among others, to engage the private sector in the ownership and management of the BMC to achieve operational efficiency and profitability, as well as reduce government's future financial obligations in, in this entity. This will be an important process in the transformation of the beef and cattle sector. Mr. Speaker, the other parastatal that requires immediate attention is the National Development Bank. In response to the persistent underperformance by NDB, my ministry engaged the African Development Bank in 2018 to undertake a diagnostic analysis of the challenges besetting the bank. A report has since been submitted by the African Development Bank, which contains specific recommendations on turning around the performance of NDB. Government has since tasked the NDB board with the responsibility to implement the African Development Bank report recommendations with immediate effect and with expected tangible results in the next two years. Strategic interventions for transformation in 2020-21. Mr. Speaker, our national vision envisages a Botswana transformed from the current upper middle income to high income by 2036. This means that the country's per capita income should exceed USD or US dollar 12,000 in current prices by the year 2036. Up from the current level, of around US dollar 8,000. With only 16 years left to reach the, 2036, the year 2036, to achieve this level of per capita income will require that the domestic economy grows by an average of at least 6% per annum against the current projected growth of 4%. Growing the economy by 6% over the next 16 years will require the implementation of robust policy measures. I repeat, Mr. Speaker, it cannot be business as usual. It cannot be. Mr. Speaker, these transformation measures are grouped into two categories. Or firstly, growing the economy for job creation and social programs for sustained livelihoods. Underlying the implementation of these policy measures are the following principles. Improving our regulatory efficiency to support private sector growth. Improving efficiency of government spending. Reducing the size of government in the economy to create space for the private sector. And of course, improving on human skills to support the transformation agenda. Growing the economy for job creation. Mr. Speaker, the 2020 budget proposals are a first deliberate effort to align to the transformation agenda with a focus on the promotion of private sector growth and job creation. Hence the focus on the following areas, investing in economic infrastructure, developing human capital, developing a vibrant agricultural sector, promoting citizen economic empowerment, investing in the creative industry, and promoting an export-led economy, investing in economic infrastructure to support transformation. Mr. Speaker, to achieve the level of growth needed to move this country from the current middle income trap, there is a need for continued investment in appropriate infrastructure. 
In this regard, government expenditure on infrastructure will target economically viable projects to support private sector-led development. With the key infrastructure needs for transformation, including electricity, energy, water, railroads, and technology. Mr. Speaker, as a demonstration of government's commitment to infrastructure development, and as promised in the ruling party's manifesto, over half of the development budget for 2020-21 is proposed for the following economic sectors. Water is allocated 1.372 billion, Transport is allocated 1.3 billion. Agriculture receives 862 million. ICT is allocated 823 million. Land servicing allocated 541.5 million. And energy is allocated 521 million. Mr. Speaker, my minister will, will revisit the process of delivering public infrastructure through the public-private partnership model. Two specific interventions in this regard during the financial year 2020-21 will be the, promal, the making of the PP, triple P procurement law, which is at an advanced stage, and the development of a strategy for financing mega projects such as roads, rail, and ICT which will form the basis for mobilizing resources from development partners, including the private sector, in order to accelerate the pace of infrastructure development. Mr. Speaker, information, communication, and technology is critical in driving economic transformation. But leveraging on ICT for the digitization of the economy requires its faster adoption. To this end, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as part of the efforts to expand access to the broadband internet services, government through Bofinet started rolling out fiber to the business and fiber to the home this financial year in Gaborone and will be extended to other parts of Botswana. Government will also capitalize on the demand for digital skills by focusing on implementation of e-services across its delivery models as part of the fourth industrial revolution. Mr. Speaker, though a significant amount of the budget is proposed for infrastructure development in the next financial year, the major challenge is project implementation. There is an urgent need to put in place measures to address the problem of delayed project delivery and implementation if the country is to transform to a high income status. A situation where the development budget is consistently underspent every year is not acceptable as it creates a credibility gap for the country's budgeting system. This happens despite efforts by my ministry through the project review and estimates committee exercises to align the annual budget requests with the capacity of the implementing ministries and departments. To address this challenge, Mr. Speaker, government will be implementing a number of initiatives, such as enhancing the three-phase project appraisal process, covering pre-feasibility, feasibility, and independent review. In this regard, the recommended budget for new projects under the financial year 2020-21 caters for pre-feasibility feasibility studies to enhance project selection, scheduling, costing, and monitoring. The ongoing capacity building programs at ministry, department, and agency level are expected to improve project implementation. Mr. Speaker, in addition, Mr. Speaker, government is reviewing the PPA D Act to, amongst others, streamline the overall procurement process, increase the thresholds for procurement devolved to implementing ministries and independent government departments in order to speed up project implementation. 
This review is expected to be completed in the 2020-21 financial year. Mr. Speaker, government has initiated the review of the Environmental Impact Assessment Act to enhance the project to enhance project implementation. The amendment, Mr. Speaker, will also promote the ease of doing business in Botswana. This is expected to improve on one area that the business community has raised with government over time. The EIA amendment bill is expected to be tabled in Parliament during 2020. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, government is also developing a decentralization policy, as promised again during elections. It is expected that the policy will be finalized during 2021 financial year. The policy will allow for supervision and accountability to be closer to where projects and programs are implemented, while this will partially address implementation challenges, it will not completely resolve the issues. Addressing the problem of implementation of programs and projects will require a rethinking of the public service delivery model, where the private sector rather than government plays a central role. Government will be exploring in the next financial year how it can work with the private sector to meaningfully deliver government programs and projects at both central and local levels. Developing human capital to support transformation. Over the years, Mr. Speaker, Botswana has invested significantly in the development of its human capital base. This trend continues in the 2020-2021 financial year, where over 20 billion is proposed for allocation to the education and health sectors, which clearly demonstrates the, this government's commitment to human capital development as promised to the voters. However, the efficiency of the expenditure on human capital development remains a concern. To address this, government plans to undertake a value for money audit of expenditure on the education and health sectors during the next financial year. As part of economic transformation, Mr. Speaker, the development model of this country has to change from a resource-based to a knowledge-based approach. Whilst, while the former model has hitherto served the country well, it is clear that it, is no longer, it can no longer be relied upon to deliver this country to a high income status. In this regard, government will be rolling out the implementation of the National Human Resource Development Plan during the financial year 2020-2021. The implementation of the plan is expected to ensure demand-driven human resource development, to enhance the employability of graduates of tertiary education institutions through an emphasis on industry collaboration. Mr. Speaker, one of the development challenges facing this country is unemployment, especially amongst young people. In response to the continued high and persistent unemployment, government with the assistance of the World Bank has adopted a draft national employment policy. The draft policy, which is still being processed within government, proposes strategies to address the supply and demand for labor, especially to address youth unemployment. So more will be shared. Developing a vibrant agricultural sector. Mr. Speaker, agriculture is one of the sectors identified for economic transformation due to its potential for growth, trade, and job creation. However, for the sector to play this role, there is need to seriously address the challenges besetting the sector, such as poor infrastructure, low productivity, low technology uptake, droughts, to mention but a few. 
addressing these challenges and others will require a change of government's approach to the development of the sector. For instance, there is need to make a distinction between subsistence and commercial agriculture, and thus tailor make policies, programs, and strategies to meet the needs of the two categories. More importantly, the financial resources deployment to these distinct groups should clearly reflect government's intention to exploit the potential agriculture value chain, trade promotion for both export and import substitution, and employment creation. The basis for adopting the reverse approach, Mr. Speaker, to agriculture development in this country is that existing agricultural programs and schemes have to be revisited with a view to aligning them to the focused, refocused role of the agricultural sector under the transformation agenda. In this context, Mr. Speaker, government is reviewing agricultural schemes such as East Part, Limit, and other subsidy schemes to enhance efficiency and effectiveness. Meanwhile, government is also providing funding for constructing silos in Panamatenge in the coming financial year as part of the common facilities to be utilized by commercial farmers operating within the agricultural special economic zone. These modern facilities will enhance both the efficiency and efficacy of grain management. Mr. Speaker, the tendering process for the project is completed and anticipated construction period of the project is 16 months. Promoting citizen economic empowerment. Mr. Speaker, one of the promises made by this government to Botswana during the past elections is its unwavering commitment to citizen economic empowerment. I stand here today to declare that government is formulating a law on citizen economic empowerment to support the existing citizen economic empowerment policy. Over the years, over the years, government has embraced citizen empowerment in its, in its development planning process because of the low citizen participation in economic development in the country. Among the existing initiatives include citizen reservation, where only 100% citizen-owned companies are eligible to participate. Price differences, preferences, where citizen-owned companies with joint ventures and associations of citizens are eligible for preference. It also includes mandatory subcontracting to citizen-owned companies. Furthermore, the citizen economic empowerment policy makes it mandatory for non-citizen contractors awarded government contracts to subcontract a minimum 40% of works, 40% to citizen-owned companies and transfer skills to subcontracted citizen-owned companies. The other existing citizen economic initiatives include the following. The economic diversification drive, where procurement is reserved for local manufacturers and service providers, regardless of citizenship. Local procurement schemes, which facilitates economic development in rural areas using public procurement in line with the CEE policy. The objective is to, to empower women, youth, and people with, living with disability in general. The scheme, Mr. Speaker, also introduces preference in tenders within the district administration tender committees threshold, whether they are administered by the district administration tender committees or ministerial tender committees. This scheme requires that a 20% target quota be reserved for the target groups in all tenders above the micro, the micro procurement financial threshold but within the district administration tender committee financial threshold at all district countrywide. Mr. Speaker, government is concerned that despite the efforts to empower Botswana through procurement, 
the price charged by the private sector for purchase of goods and services by government is substantially higher than the market price. This means that government does not get value for money. Therefore, the private sector needs to appreciate that by so doing, they are depriving the public of essential services that are expected to be provided by government. With regards to participation of citizens in the tourism sector, Mr. Speaker, government reserves some licenses for citizen operators only. To further enhance meaningful participation of citizens in the tourism sector, government has reserved certain concessions for allocations to citizens only. Meanwhile, Mr. Speaker, government will prioritize upgrading of infrastructure, both physical and ICT, to tourism areas, and the private sector will be expected to also contribute resources in this regard. We said transformation requires all of us. Mr. Speaker, despite the existence of these schemes, which I have just outlined, effective citizens' participation in some sectors of our economy has not been satisfactory. Hence the decision to move from policy to law to ensure effectiveness in application and implementation of the Citizen Economic Empowerment Agenda. The law will address the inequalities of the past by transforming the country's wealth or transferring the country's wealth to disadvantaged Botswana, therefore allowing for more participation of citizens in the economy. Investing in the creative industry. Mr. Speaker, the creative industry sector can and has the potential to brand and market Botswana, as well as contribute towards job creation and economic diversification. Furthermore, the creative industry can harness the demographic dividend by opening opportunities for exploring talents. Mr. Speaker, Forbes under 30 is coming to Botswana. And I must add that for the first time, an African country and in Sub-Saharan Africa is hosting Forbes Under 30. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this president's initiative is a public-private partnership, which has previously been hosted in the United States of America, Hong Kong, Netherlands, and Israel. It is an event for the best 600 under 30 years entrepreneurs. 200 of the world's best, 200 of Africa's best, and 200 of Botswana's best, brightest and innovative entrepreneurs. They will be here, Mr. Speaker, in Botswana. Mr. Speaker, government is promoting the growth and pres preservation of the arts and culture. To this end, government has signed a number of cultural agreements with other countries as a way of availing opportunities at regional level, continental and international levels for arts and culture practitioners. A number of policies and legislation, such as the Cinematography Act and entertainment legislation, are also being reviewed in order to create comparative advantage within the arts and cultural sector. These policy initiatives will be implemented with expediency to allow the sector to grow and lay partners for its development. I must add, Mr. Speaker, that these policies will come to nothing if not implemented in partnership with the private sector. Reforming the regulatory business environment for investment. Mr. Speaker, Botswana has not been doing well in the area of business regulation, as measured by the World Bank's Doing Business Index. In the 2020 Doing Business Report, the country ranked 87 out of 190 economies around the world, compared to 86 in the 2019 report. In this regard, the government has since 2014 been implementing a set of doing business 
reform measures. The objective is to ensure a focused agenda on reforming and improving the doing business and investment climate through enhancement of both the administrative and regulatory framework. Mr. Speaker, a number of reforms were completed during the 2019-20 financial year. This includes the online business registration system, which was launched in June 2019, with the key objective being to achieve faster, cheaper, and more accurate business registration. As part of this reform, the Companies and Intellectual Property Authority has integrated with the Department of National and Civil Registration, and efforts are ongoing to finalize the integration with Botswana Unified Revenue Service, as well as the PPADB systems. The integration process is expected to be completed by the end of March 2020, next month. Furthermore, the e-visa portal will be developed during the 2020-21 financial year to, en to enable online application and issuance of visas. All these measures, Mr. Speaker, are to facilitate movement of persons and aid investment into this country, thereby promoting the creation of jobs for Botswana. Mr. Speaker, the 11th session of Parliament also passed pieces of legislation aimed at improving the business environment, and this includes the Trade Act and Industrial Development Act. The two acts will allow the issuance of licenses and registration certificates over the count. Mr. Speaker, in July 2019, Cabinet approved a comprehensive and internationally competitive incentive package, which the Special Economic Zone Authority says will use to attract foreign direct investment. These incentives include, amongst others, 5% corporate tax for the first 10 years and 10% thereafter. Provision of fully serviced land, fast tracking of land applications, providing single window and streamlined investor facilitation processes. Also a waiver on duty, transfer duty on land and property, and property tax exemption for the first five years of operation. The CESA model is therefore export-oriented, thus aligned to the national priority of promoting export-led growth. Mr. Speaker, the benefits of CESA or special economic zones can only be realized through implementation. It cannot be business as usual. Before I leave the topic on reforming of the country's business regulatory environment, I wish to mention, Mr. Speaker, that our continued efforts in this regard have recently been acknowledged by the French Republic as it decided to remove Botswana from the list of non-cooperative states and territories in tax matters. This follows Botswana's signing of the amendment of, of the bilateral tax treaty in July 2017, allowing the exchange of tax information as per the latest standards of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Social programs to sustain livelihoods. Mr. Speaker, the quest to move this country to a high income status will ensure that those within our society who for various reasons cannot meaningfully participate in mainstream economic activities are not left behind. In this regard, government will continue to implement social welfare programs as, as promised in its election manifesto to ensure that we achieve inclusive growth. Mr. Speaker, as part of the transformation and efficient use of public funds, great focus will be put on the efficiency and effectiveness of these programs. A situation where the cost of delivering some of these programs far exceeds the value of the programs cannot be allowed to continue in this era of budget constraints. Furthermore, the design and implementation of, of social welfare programs will be revisited to ensure maximum benefit to the targeted beneficiaries. 
inclusive social protection. Mr. Speaker, government continues to implement various social protection programs to provide services to destitute persons, people who are living with disabilities, community-based care patients, old age pensioners, World War II veterans, and populations severely affected by drought, as well as orphans and vulnerable children. The amount of resources proposed for these programs in the 2021-2021 budget bears testimony to government's commitment to ensure that these vulnerable groups are catered for. <laughs> Poverty eradication. Mr. Speaker, government remains committed to addressing all forms of poverty. In this regard, a draft national poverty eradication policy has been developed. The policy is aimed at providing a coordinated and multidimensional approach towards poverty reduction in the country. Mr. Speaker, one program that is an integral part of poverty reduction is IPLEG. This is a temporary relief initiative used by government to, to reach all segments of communities in Botswana. This program, Mr. Speaker, will be reorientated to perform productive activities and mobilize communities to enhance their participation in local development. Mr. Speaker, this is health care reform. Mr. Speaker, as part of the reforms, the health financing strategy developed during the second quarter of 2019 will, amongst others, enhance efficiency by involving the private sector in the delivery of health services at full cost recovery rates to ensure financial sustainability. The strategy, Mr. Speaker, will increase revenue streams and sustain long-term expenditure within the health sector. It is worth noting that the strategy is undergoing the process of approval, which is expected to be completed during the first half of 2020. Local economic development framework and implementation for Botswana. Mr. Speaker, government continues to build capacity of the districts to, imp to effectively implement the local economic development framework and, imp and implementation plan for Botswana. The local economic development process was, was piloted in four administrative districts of Chobe, Francis Town, Kalahadi, and Soa Town since 2014. These pilot districts embarked on the identification of upstream and downstream businesses and bankable business plans, including fish farming in Chobe, small stock in Kalahari, waste management projects in Francis Town, and ecotourism projects in Suwa Town. Mr. Speaker, during the coming financial year, the focus will be on upscaling, deepening, and rolling out the local economic development process to other districts to empower local community governments to engage the business sector to avoid expenditure leaks from those districts and retain cash in their localities, thereby creating more uh, job opportunities. Budget reviews and proposals. Mr. Speaker, the actual budget outturn for the first three years of NDP 11 recorded budget deficits. Therefore, it is imperative that while the 2020-21 budget proposals were prepared in line with the economic transformation agenda, government is conscious of its commitment to fiscal discipline and maintenance of long-term fiscal sustainability. In putting together the 2020-21 budget proposals, we have therefore been guided by the, by the philosophy that the government budget should support the country's economic transformation agenda whilst preserving fiscal sustainability. The underlying strategic intent is to see all Botswana benefiting from the economic prosperity of this country. 2018-2019 budget out there. Mr. Speaker, the overall fiscal balance for 2018-2019 financial year is a deficit of 4.6% of GDP. 
Total revenues and grants amount to 53.47 billion, whilst total expenditure and net, net lending, on the other hand, is 62.35 billion. Hence the deficit. The 2019-2020 revised budget estimates. Mr. Speaker, the revised fiscal balance for the 2019-2020 financial year is a deficit of 3.9% of GDP from 4.4. Total revenues and grants for the 2019-2020 financial year are revised to 60.71 billion and the main revenue items revised are as follows. Mineral revenues at 18.43 billion, customs and exercise at 13.79 billion, and VAT at 7.92 billion. The revised total expenditure and lead lending for 2019-2020 amount to 68.64 billion. The revision is mainly because of the supplementary budget under the recent, the recurrent budget amounting to 1.1 billion approved by Parliament in December 2019. 2020-2021 budget proposals. Mr. Speaker, the 2020-2021 proposed budget responds to the need to transform the economy to a higher income status in line with the transformation agenda of the new government, of the new government. This is supported by significant proposed budget allocations to programs and initiatives that are aimed at growing the economy in terms of infrastructure development, human capital skills development, social inclusion, and the provision of the required national peace and security. The proposed allocations, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> take into account the constrained fiscal space and government's commitment to restoring a budget balance. This calls for rigorous fiscal consolidation measures, which government will, will institute in 2020-2021 in financial year. These measures include sustained efforts to intensify revenue optimization, enhancing collections, efficiencies, cost containment, developing effective strategies to minimize and ultimately eliminate waste, as well as concerted efforts to rebuild a culture of high performance in the economy. I will elaborate later in the speech on the specific measures to be instituted. Total revenues and grants. Mr. Speaker, total revenues and grants for the 2020-21 financial year amount to 62.39 billion, of which mineral revenue is estimated 20.02 billion. Custom excise revenue is expected to be 15.38 billion, with non-mineral income tax estimated at 14.22 billion, while VAT is expected to amount to 8.55 billion pula. My ministry is working with ministers on the review of user fees and service charges across government. So far, the Minister of Agriculture Development and Food Security, Environment, Natural Resources, Conservation and Tourism, Land Management, Water and Sanitation Services, Transport and Communications, as well as Defense, Justice and Security are undertaking fee charges review. It is expected that additional annual revenue in excess of 500 million will be collected upon implementation of the revised fees and charges. <laughs> Total expenditure and net lending. Mr. Speaker, the budget process and preparation for 2020-2021 financial involved budgeting through thematic working groups and thus developing a more explicit linkage between national development plan priorities and allowing allocation of spending to high priority areas to meet government's national development goals. Mr. Speaker, the total expenditure and debt lending for the financial year 2020-21 is estimated 
5.62 billion. The result, well, this results in a deficit of 5.22 billion, or 2.4 percent of GDP, from 4.4 .4 in 2018, which is less than the projected deficit of 3.9 percent in the 2019-2020 financial year. This represents the first step towards a healthier fiscal position, Mr. Speaker. Ministerial recurrent budget. Mr. Speaker, the recommended ministerial recurrent expenditure for 2020-21 financial year amounts to 51.37 billion, representing an increase of 9.3% over the current year's approved budget. The bulk of this increase is mainly attributed to the budgetary provisions for the previously negotiated and agreed public service salary and associated allowances by 10% and 6%, including for the executive, members of parliament, judges, decosi, councillors, and social security allowances. Mr. Speaker, five ministries, namely Basic education, defense, justice and security, health and wellness, local government and rural development, and tertiary education, research, science and technology, account for 60.2% of the total ministerial recurrent budget. Of the total recurrent budget. The Minister of Education, Mr. Speaker, is allocated the largest share of the proposed ministerial recurrent budget amounting to 9.01 billion pool. 9.01 billion pool. The significant budget allocation demonstrates government's commitment to deliver the human capital development priority, which is a prerequisite for the transition to a knowledge-based economy. The second largest share of 8.56 billion is allocated to the Ministry of Defense, Justice and Security. Expenditure on security should be viewed as national insurance. The provision of adequate national security and maintaining the rule of law are critical for national development and doing business. Hence the sizable allocation. The, the proposed ministerial recurrent budget for the Minister of Health and Wellness is 7.73 billion, making the third largest recommended ministerial recurrent budget allocation. This allocation is consistent with government's commitment to invest adequately in healthcare as an integral part of human capital development, which is necessary for economic growth. The budget mainly covers the cost of the provision of drugs, dressings, and vaccines and antiretroviral therapy. The fourth largest share of the proposed budget amounts, amounting to 7.15 billion is allocated to the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. The budget is intended to, among others, drive initiatives aimed at providing local governance, strengthening social development, and promoting local economic development. It therefore covers transfers to districts and urban councils, which accounts for 56.4% of this ministry's proposed recurrent budget. The recommended budget allocation for the Ministry of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology is 4.89 billion, which represents the fifth largest share of the proposed ministerial recurrent budget. The main items on the recommended budget include the cost of tertiary students' bursaries, as well as subventions to government tertiary institutions. Other ministries with substantial budget allocations are Minister of Transport and Communications at 1.93 billion, Minister of Presidential Affairs, Governance and Public Administration at 1.65 billion, Minister of Agriculture, Development and Food Security at 1.39 billion, Minister of Trade and Industry at 1.07 billion. Minister of Lands Management, Water and Sanitary Services at 1.04 billion. 
and Minister of Finance and Economic Development at 1 billion. The remaining recommended ministerial recurrent budget of 5.95 billion is shared amongst other ministries, including extra ministerial departments. The development budget. Mr. Speaker, the proposed development budget for 2020-2021 financial year is 12.03 billion. The proposed development budget takes into account the capacity constraints in the economy, which has affected impl implementation of projects. The, the position of government is that after completion of ongoing projects, only new projects, uh, only new programs and projects that support transformation will be prioritized and funded going forward. As a result, over 80% of the proposed development budget will mainly be for continued implementation of ongoing projects, such as in the water, energy, roads, and ICT sectors as the economic drivers which support the transformation agenda. In order to enhance, Mr. Speaker, the implementation of projects, training on project management, including risk assessment, emotional intelligence, and change management, is ongoing to build the requisite capacity across government. To this end, I wish to implore the private sector, as well as our key stakeholders in project implementation, to upscale their commitment to cost effectiveness, timely as well as good quality project implementation. Mr. Speaker, in the coming financial year, the Minister of Land Management, Water and Sanitation Services will engage the private sector in the implementation of the reclamation and treatment of the Khaborone wastewater. The Minister of Mineral Resources, Green Technology and Energy Security will also engage a private sector developer for the coal to liquid project. The feasibility studies for the above two projects have been finalized and are under consideration by government. Mr. Speaker, a number of activities to prepare some projects for private sector participation through Triple P's will be undertaken during the coming financial year. In this regard, my ministry will review the delivery model for PPP projects with a view to, coordinate, to coordinating the effective delivery. Mr. Speaker, you may recall that during NDP 10, government established thematic working groups covering four thematic areas as pillars in order to improve coordination and effectiveness in the planning and budgeting system. Mr. Speaker, in terms of the pillars, the Economy and Employment Thematic Working Group gets the largest share of the development budget. This indicates that government is committed to improving services that will make the country more competitive, as well as facilitating the ease of doing business by focusing on economic diversification initiatives. Tour initiatives tourism development, land management, e-service, and indeed agriculture. In this regard, the Economy and Employment Thematic Working Group has been allocated the largest share of the development budget at 6.93 billion pula. The Social Upliftment Thematic Working Group overall goal is to achieve a dignified life for all citizens through the delivery of programs and projects that ensure the upliftment of economically marginalized and socially vulnerable groups. The proposed budget for this thematic working group is 2.53 a billion pula. Mr. Speaker, the governance and security thematic working group gets 2.40 billion pula. This entails good governance, observance of the rule of law, and a stable security environment. It has been identified as a key developmental priority to be pursued in NDP 11 in order to contribute towards the achievement of the Vision 2036 Pillar of Governance, Peace and Security. The Sustainable Environment Thematic Working Group is allocated 164.57 million. Government will ensure that implementation of programs and projects across all sectors will mitigate and support the country to adapt to climate change. Botswana has always underscored 
the need for the country to pursue its economic, its economic development without unduly sacrificing the environment. Mr. Speaker, turning to the specific ministerial allocations, the Ministry of Land Management, Water and Sanitation Services is allocated the largest share of the proposed development budget at 2.07 billion or 17.21%, mainly to support initiatives geared towards improvement of water supply and management in the country. The water projects account for 1.90 billion or 83% of the ministry's allocation. This includes the North-South carrier, two from Palape to Mamashia to Khaburoni, which is meant to provide water to the southern part of Botswana. The Kanyan North-South carrier connection, Moshopa sanitation projects, land servicing at Muchudi, Siliba Pique, Mabutsane, Hansi, and Moshopa, as well as the Botswana Emergency Water Security and Efficiency Project, which is partly funded through the World Bank. The Minister of Defense, Justice and Security is allocated the second largest share at 1.94 billion or 16.14%. The bulk of the proposed budget will go to the Botswana Defense Force for air assets, <laughs> vehicles, as well as defense and communications equipment. The balance, Mr. Speaker, will be shared between the Botswana Police Service to cater for the construction of police stations and staff houses, and the Department of Prisons and Rehabilitation Services for the provision of prison infrastructure, equipment, and storage facilities. <laughs> the third largest share of the proposed development budget, Mr. Speaker, is allocated to the Minister of Transport and Communication at 1.62 billion or 13.51%. The proposed budget is mainly for major roads and bridge projects, including Mohembo Bridge, construction of three intersections along the KT Mutsete Drive, Mohoditsane Habani Mankodi Road, Kaburoni Boatle Jualing, Malambakwena Tsesebe, Dibeti Maokane Machani, Mandunyani Shashemuake Matangwan, Makalama Beijimutopi Bitumen Roads, as well as the traffic control modernization and centralized traffic control for the Greater Kaburoni area. The budget also caters for the following ICT projects government data network upgrading, national backbone networks, government data center, and local access networks. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Local Government and Rural Development takes the, largest, the fourth largest share of the proposed development budget at 1.25 billion or 10.41% in order to continue implementation of social protection programs and village infrastructure projects. The proposed programs and projects under the ministry include primary school backlog eradication program, community development projects, internal roads, and travel administration infrastructure development. Mr. Speaker, the fifth largest share of 1.09 billion or 9.05% is allocated to the Ministry of Minerals, Resources, Green Technology and Energy to cater for the ongoing north-west transmission grid connection. Rural electrification, Murupula B remedial works and transmission backbone for Muchudi, Kamen and Klaib and Khabaroni Central. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Agricultural Development and Food Security takes the sixth largest share of the proposed development budget at 976.17 million or 8.12%. This amount covers major projects such as Ispahad Limit and refurbishment of the Botswana University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. As indicated earlier, government will reorientate all programs, including agricultural programs, to improve productivity in their delivery and impact on the beneficiaries. Mr. Speaker, the remaining ministerial departments share the balance of 3.07 billion or 25.55% to, to cater for major projects, including 
staff houses and maintenance of primary schools, poverty eradication program, construction and upgrading of health facilities such as Tutume, Mushopa, Shakahawe and Letlakane hospitals. Housing schemes such as the Self-Help Housing Agency, SHA, Poverty Alleviation Scheme, and, and District Housing for the Low-Income Groups. The budget also caters for refurbishment of brigades, which is part of the Youth Empowerment Initiative. Statutory Expenditure. Mr. Speaker, statutory expenditure takes precedence over the recurrent and development expenditure. The budget for statutory expenditure for 2020-21 financial year is 10.59 billion. Major items under this category of expenditure include public debt servicing, pensions, gratuity and compensation. The increase of 3.40 billion over the 2019-20 approved budget is mainly attributed to the expected repayment for bond BW008, which matures in September 2020. Overall balance. Mr. Speaker, with total revenues and grants estimated 62.39 billion, and total expenditure and late lending forecast as at 67.62 billion, a budget deficit of 5.22 billion or 2.4% of GDP is projected for the 2020-21 financial year. Despite the projected budget deficit, government remains committed to achieve a fiscal sustainability in the medium term. This is in line with the commitment to restore fiscal balance and rebuild the cash reserves. Some of the measures planned during the course of the coming financial year are discussed below. Mr. Speaker, fiscal measures to restore fiscal balance. The country's fiscal path is unsustainable. Whereas the NDP 11 had envisaged a moderate cumulative budget surplus over the six year period, the latest forecasts contained in the mid -term, draft mid term review of NDP 11 projects a significant cumulative budget deficit over the six year plan period. A budget deficit of 5.22 billion is forecast, therefore, for this financial year, or for 2020-21, which I must also state represents a reduced balance of 2.4% of GDP. Such projected deficits appear amid huge investments that are expected in economic infrastructure to support the transformation agenda. Mr. Speaker, despite the foregoing situation, my ministry is determined to restore fiscal sustainability in the medium term and start to build budget surpluses in the last two years of NDP 11 as part of the effort to rebuild the country's financial buffers that were seriously eroded over the past few years. A number of measures will be undertaken on the revenue and expenditure sites both in the short term and in the long term, in order to achieve the stated objectives. On the revenue side, there are various fees, charges and levies, which have not been adjusted for some time. Some of these fees, charges and levies, were last adjusted a decade ago. As part of the efforts to address the budget deficit, all fees Charges and levies will be adjusted with effect, with effect from the 1st of April 2020. Thereafter, an annual, on an annual basis. Measures will also be put in place to implement the cost recovery policy, including collection of tertiary students' loan repayments. Mr. Speaker, BEARS will also redeploy resources in key operational areas to enhance revenue collection. Specifically, 
intensify debt reduction efforts and increasing ins inspections on imported goods to curb instances of non-compliance by importers at points of entry. Mr. Speaker, while there is scope to adjust the tax rates, considering their levels relative to the region, priority would, in the interim, be on improving efficiency in the collection of exi existing taxes rather than adjust tax rates. On the expenditure side, Mr. Speaker, the policy objective is to maintain government's contribution to 30% of GDP and below in order to give space to the private sector. In addition, the composition of government budget will have to be changed in favor of more development. A recurrent budget represents consumption, as it comprises mainly of salaries and running costs, whilst development budget is investment which is necessary for growth of the economy. To achieve transformation, therefore, requires more investment in capital projects than spending on consumption. This balance between recurrent and development will be altered through process and technology adoption across the government. It is about efficiency, efficient delivery of services, Mr. Speaker. Among the specific expenditure control measures for 2020-21, my ministry will be working with selected pilot ministries to deal with wastage, focusing on other charges items of the budget. In particular, the pilot exercise will involve subjecting other charges in the selected ministries to the zero budgeting principle for the next financial year. Depending on the outcome of the pilot exercise, the application of the zero-based budget approach to other charges will be extended to the rest of the ministries in NDP 12. The ultimate objective, Mr. Speaker, is to move from incremental budgeting to zero-based budgeting in, in the medium term, which is the most effective way to control expenditure waste. Mr. Speaker, my ministry is reviewing the Public Finance Management Act. The objective of the, re the review is to enhance the legal and regulatory framework for the control and management of public finances in line with international best practice. The review covers, amongst others, the devolution of some financial responsibilities and powers to accounting officers to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of ministries in the provision of better public services. Public service salaries. Mr. Speaker, cordial industrial relations between government and the public sector unions in maintaining them. Government will continue implementation of the agreed salary increments from the 2019 negotiations. The negotiated and agreed increments were 10% salary increment awarded to the A and B salary bands, and a 6% increment to the C and D bands for 2019-20 and 2020-21 financial years. Mr. Speaker, the engagement with public sector unions has also to be about transformation and improvement on the delivery of services for the economy. The reform and transformation program should start with government and the union leadership. Conclusion. Conclusion. Mr. Speaker, the 2020-21 budget, as stated, provides the first major step by government towards economic transformation, anchored on private sector-led growth. The main objective is to transform the economy and lay the foundation for a knowledge-based and technology-based economy and graduate from an upper middle income to a high-income country. Mr. Speaker, despite the positive domestic economic outlook, the country's fiscal position remains tight. However, <laughs> government remains determined, as I demonstrated earlier in this speech,
to restore the country's fiscal balance. To this end, my ministry will be undertaking measures to increase revenue and expenditure during the coming financial year in order to provide more resources to fund a robust and ambitious infrastructure program to support the transition to high income status. Mr. Speaker, the goal is to strike a balance between optimal funding of projects and programs necessary for driving economic transformation without setting the country into an unsustainable fiscal trajectory. As a government, government will control the growth of the recurrent budget through, for instance, the adoption of appropriate technology, thereby releasing more funds for capital expenditure. Mr. Speaker, as I conclude, I wish to take this opportunity to thank all our development partners, both bilateral and multilateral organizations, for continued support in many ways to our development endeavors, ranging from grants, loans and technical assistance, amongst others. We look forward to their continued cooperation as the country embarks on the transformation journey towards the year 2036 and beyond. Mr. Speaker, I now move that the appropriation 2020 stroke 2021 bill number two of 2020 be read for the second time. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.